Okay, um, it's my pleasure today to introduce Sebastian Kirsch. Uh, many years ago was a log accessory with me in Google Dublin. These days um, is floating around Zurich without portfolio, but previously of uh, calendar and Gmail front end accessory. So uh, today he's going to talk about why monitoring doesn't always work like you think it does. Um, and just discussing this with Narayan out in the corridor, a lot of it is because people don't understand statistics. A lot, a lot of it is because most teams don't actually care that much. They just want monitoring good enough to debug with. They don't care if it's actually accurate. So um, enjoy. All right. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. It's nice to see so many of you here. Uh, I'm Sebastian, as John mentioned, Site Reliability Engineer for Google in Zurich. This is the many ways your monitoring is lying to you. And uh, this talk was essentially born out of frustration. A couple of months ago, I was debugging a problem with the startup phase of one of our servers. And I spent about a day pouring through logs, figuring out what was going on, setting up fine-grained monitoring for it, and so on and so forth. And then at some point realized that actually the problem I was looking for didn't exist. It was an artifact generated by the monitoring system that I just, had, I, I just spent an entire day chasing after. So I was frustrated. And I figured I'd channel my frustration into something productive, and I would do a talk about this. I would do a talk about all the different ways that your monitoring can mislead you. It can show you problems where there actually is no problem. It can hide problems from you. How the world looks different depending on where you're standing, what you're, where, where you're observing it from, and so on. Um, this talk is categorized into different categories of lies that your monitoring system can tell you. And this is also not exhaustive. There are many, many, many more. And also, they're all interrelated. Very often when you're debugging problems, you run into several of these at the same time. So basically, what I want you to go away from this talk with is a repertoire of different different ways that your monitoring can fail you, and also a healthy distrust in the graphs and charts that you're seeing on your dashboards. So I don't want to concentrate too much on the, on the individual failure modes. I'll give you examples, but the message that I want to send home at the end is don't trust the, day and don't, don't trust the system. Always question, if something looks fishy on your dashboards, always questions, is this something that's, that's happening in the system itself or in, the, in, your, in your monitoring system? As a short way of introducing this problem that we're talking about is um, just want to give, give a small example, a small metaphor um, for the problem that we're talking about. Um, this is a snippet from, uh, from Google Maps. Um, quaint Swiss village called Zermatt. Has anybody here been there? A couple of people have been there. Um, if you haven't been there, looking at the map will not prepare you for what you're going to see if you go to this place. What you're going to see if you go there is this. It's absolutely stunning. This is the Matterhorn. You, you go to Zermatt, you step off the train, and you step into the postcard. Um, and having looked at the map beforehand doesn't prepare you for that. So the, so the, 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 uh, the, the, the term that you're going to find this under is map is not the territory. There is, there is a difference between a representation of a thing and the thing itself. And the same holds for monitoring system. There is a difference between the representation that the monitoring system has of a system at the system itself. Uh, you also find this in art. You probably remember the, um, the, the famous Magritte painting with a pipe that says it's, this is not a pipe. And indeed it is. It's a representation of a pipe. You can't smoke it. 
So this is what we're talking about. The map is not the territory. Now, before I go into the examples, I am going to give you a quick introduction on time series based monitoring. Um, there is another talk later today um, by Bjorn Rabenstein that would go into this with a little bit more detail. So I'll just give the, I'll give the shortest in introduction I can, I can do. Because most of the examples that I'm going to present are from time series based monitoring. So how does that work? Basically, you have a couple of servers that you're monitoring. You have a monitoring system, you have a dashboarding system. Each of the servers exports variables. So each of the servers will say, well, since startup time, I've had like eight requests, 14 requests, five requests, and so on. And the monitoring system regularly pulls the individual servers to figure out what the value of those variables is. The monitoring system then assembles those into time series, um, sort of lines them up per server, does aggregations on them, sums them up, um, does rates on them, and so on and so forth, and then produces a nice dashboard on that. In the real world, this is usually not that simple. Um, very often, the monitoring data will go, well, for one, the monitoring system will also um, look at other servers, not just, not just four or something. It will look at potentially thousands of them. Uh, very often, the data also goes through an aggregator that may assemble data from other sources as well. And it can also happen that the data that you're getting from your individual servers actually does not, does not originate there because very often you will re-export data from the environment um, into, into your, from your service so that the monitoring system has an easier time um, collecting that. So this is what time series based monitoring looks like. And with that, I'm gonna go straight into the first category, which is lies of omission. How does your monitoring system deal with data that is simply not there? And there's a number of reasons why data might, not, might simply not be there. Well, the server might be in startup or in shutdown, so it's not responding to requests from the monitoring system. Um, there might be a network error, there might be some other kind of blip that, and that um, prevents the monitoring system from collecting the data. Um, other types of problems, you might, you might have an implementation of your um, of your data exporter that only exports data the first time it has been called. So you might have variables that only appear at some point after startup of the server. Say you have one that says how many failed requests did I have? And that only appears on the first time you had a request failure. So you have these variables that, that sort of blip in and out of existence. Um, other failure modes we've had We've had a system that we've had a client library that silently truncated the monitoring results after 20 megabytes. So if you were exporting more than 20 megabytes of data, the monitoring system would just truncate it and, um, and omit the rest. There's a ver variety of reasons why data might not be there. So what does that look like? Um, I'm gonna step you through a brief example of how monitoring can, can look like. So say we wanna calculate the request rate um, for our system. Our servers export um, how many requests they've had since startup, so like one, no request, one request, two requests, three requests, and so on. Um, we do sort of rate function um, on that by taking the difference, taking the delta between the individual data points, um, gives us a rate of one event per, per period of, um, of time, um, gives us a new time series, same for the other servers, then we sum all those up um, and on the time dimension, get to a sum of four, do the same for the other data points, and then we get a nice dashboard that shows us four events per, day, per time period for the, entire, um, for the entire system. Now, let's say rather than having this nice straight line um, for the event rate, what if you have a graph that looks like this? So it's not a straight line, it dips, and then it spikes again, and then it goes on as, as previous. Uh, some of you might have seen graphs like this in, um, in the real world. The way something like this can occur is the following. You have 
a, um, you, have, well, you have your service um, exporting your, your requests, and there is a data point missing. So where we have the, um, the, the little X here in the, um, in the first time series, um, for some reason, there's no data point. Maybe there was a network outage, maybe there was some other sort of blip, so the monitoring system couldn't get the data. Now what happens now is the following. The monitoring system tries to generate these dates. In the, in the second position in the time series, well, there's no data point here, so it can't generate a data point um, on, the, on the output, on the rate. Next, next position in the time series, well, there is a data point here, the three, but there's no previous data point, so the monitoring system might look back in time and try and figure out, well, where is the last data point I've, I've seen? And it sees the one in the previous position, takes the difference between those two, gets a two. Summing those up, so we get a new time series, um, one missing spot, two, one. Same for the other service, summing those up, um, get, a, get a four, then we get a three with a missing data point, but we're making up for that on the next, on the next time point in the, in the time series. Get to a five and back to a four. This is how you can get a graph like this. You will notice that the area under the graph is actually exactly the same one as the previous graph, as the straight line. So the system is not lying to you when it comes to total requ request volume. It's just lying to you when it comes to how many requests it's seen at, at which point. So that's a concrete example of lies by omission. Let's go to the, um, to the next example. Lies of granular granularity. Um, this obviously goes back to the, um, to, to the shannon Nyquist theory um, to, and to sampling theory. Something that's at or that, 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 um, that occurs at or smaller granularity than your sampling interval, you can't reason about it. You can't see what, what is actually happening. So that means that it's really, really important to look at, um, at events in, at the right granularity. Because if you choose two cores of granularity, that can hide a lot, of, um, a lot of behavior of the system from you. It can hide oscillations, it can hide feedback loops, and basically you're not going to, to know what's happening. Um, quick example to illustrate that. Let's say we have this graph of request, vo uh, request volume. That sort of is fairly low, then we get, um, we get an upward slope, it stabilizes at a higher level, and then it goes back down again. If we're taking if we're sampling this graph at 10 minute intervals, we get these three data points. We get a low data point, a high data point, and a low data point. Looks pretty good, right? That's a fair approximation of what's happening in the system. Um, because like the low data points are where the, uh, where the actual low mark was, the high data point is where the higher level was, and then it goes back down, so everything's fine. Let's look at another graph looks like this. If you sample this graph at the same granularity, at the same 10 minute granularity, you're going to get exactly the same output. Even though the effects of this type of request pattern on your system can be dramatically different from the previous one. This is the type of request pattern that can run you out of memory, can run you out of threat pools, can deadlock your system, and so on and so forth. And you look at the graphs and you'd be like, well, this looks normal. This is not different from things that I've seen before. So that means that it's crucially important to look at things at the right granularity. Now, high granularity monitoring is expensive because you're generating a lot of load on your servers and you're also storing a lot of data. So you might be thinking, well, I'm going to be smart about this. I'm only going to do high granularity monitoring when I actually need it. And when I actually need it is usually when I'm debugging something. So how about I do high granularity monitoring when I'm actively deb debugging something and at some point I downsample all that data and then I throw the high granularity data away. If you have a smart monitoring system that, looks, that does this, you can end up with graphs like this. 
Um, this is an example from a monitoring system that automatically downsamples data after three hours in order to save on, um, in order to save on resources. The change in graph shape is only due to the downsampling. There is no change in behavior from the system at all. This is just an artifact generated by the monitoring system itself. All right, on to the next one. Next one is lies of perspective. The world can look very, very different based on where you're standing. And there are some effects in the system that depending, where, depending on where you're standing, you might not be able to see them. So to illustrate this, um, let's look at this, uh, this simplified example. Say you have a monitoring system, client and a server. Client tries to contact the server. And for some reason, the request does not make it through. Um, as I said, might be a network error, might be something different, does not really matter. Now, what does this look like from the perspective of the monitoring system? That depends on who you're asking. So if, you, if the monitoring system is asking the client side, well, the client will say, well, I tried to send one request and one of them errored out, and um, yeah, that's bad. If you look at the server side, everything looks fine. Well, I didn't get any requests, but no errors. I don't see any problems from my perspective. Um, similarly, problems like this can happen when you have a server in startup or in shutdown. So let's say we look at this example. We have a server that is shutting down at some point in the timeline. And we have a monitoring system that makes regular requests and a client that, um, that sends um, actual user requests to the server. So what happens when that server shuts down? Well, monitoring system regularly pulls the server about its internal state. So we're saying, well, we've got zero requests and zero errors at this point, four requests, zero errors at this point. What's happening at the last data point, at the last collection cycle in the monitoring system? The server has shut down at this point. So there is nothing for the monitoring system to actually contact. So the only thing that the monitoring system can, uh, can report on is its previous data. What we want the monitoring system to say is the following. Well, we have 10 requests in total, but from the client side, the client tried to send three requests after shutdown, so they didn't get handled. So there's three errors. What the monitoring system actually sees is the following. It just sees the previous data point. Four requests, zero errors, and the entire problem in the, in the shutdown phase here is completely hidden from you. This is something that you can only get from client-side monitoring. If you want accurate data about this, this type of behavior, you have to ask the clients. If your clients happen to be not under your control because your clients are web browsers, for example, well, you're gonna have a hard time getting this kind of data. But these examples might have convinced you that it's always better to look at the client side. Um, if you do that, if you concentrate on client side monitoring, you run into another class of problems, which is some data is only known on the server side. So you're going, to, you're going to run into the problem of having to align data from the client side and the server side. So you're going to align data from different types of systems in the same monitoring expressions. And you can run into another class of problems with that um, that I'm gonna call lying through alignment. I don't have an example of correlating client-side and server-side data, but I have another example um, for you of correlating data that's generated by the servers with correlating data that's generated by the monitoring system itself. So let's look at an example. Let's, look, let's say in your dashboarding system you have these two graphs. Well, you have one with memory consumption and you have one that counts how often servers are restarting. And you're looking at them and you're seeing, well, memory consumption goes up and tasks are restarting. So that sounds a lot as if you're running out of memory. And 
your servers just get killed because they they because they 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 run out of memory. Um, there is another explanation for this, though, and in order to understand that explanation, and that explanation has to do with the monitoring system. In order to understand that, we'll have to look at a different graph, and that is the graph of task availability. How many tasks, how many servers does the monitoring system actually think are up? And in this case, well, our servers are restarting so quickly that the monitoring system can only see about 75% at any time because the other ones are just either shutting down or starting back up. Now, if we overlay the graph on the right-hand side and the graph on the left-hand side, it looks like this. Has anybody noticed something about this graph? They're symmetrical. So, what somebody did in order to calculate the mean memory consumption of our servers is the following. Well, they said, we're going to take a shortcut. We're going to sum up how much memory the individual servers are reporting that they're using, and then we're just going to divide that by how many of servers the monitoring system can contact. Now, when the task count went down, the monitoring system could not contact the individual servers. So in order to sum up the memory consumption, it just went back in time and used the last known, last known memory consumption. So memory consumption in this case actually stayed constant um, across all of the servers. Just by doing this type of calculation, by taking this kind of shortcut, um, we arrived at a graph that misled us into thinking that we're actually using more memory. Um, all right, this was lying through alignment, things that can happen if you try to correlate data from different perspectives. Next one, lies of presentation. Um, there is going to be another talk in about 50 minutes from now um, about this exam, well, about some of this and some of this topic. Um, this is going to be structure and interpretation of, of graphs. And I'm just going to give you a couple of quick examples of how graphs can mislead you so that when you go to the next talk, you can sort of have this at the back of your mind and say, oh yeah, but where could this go wrong? Where could these, where could these graphs uh, mislead me? How could I misinterpret these graphs? So, lines of presentation. Um, very, very simple ones. This is a graph of task count. Fluctuating highly. Um, that must mean that servers are restarting all over the place. Until you start looking at the axis on the, um, on the left-hand side and you see, well, this is actually not centered at zero. If we center this at zero, the graph looks like this. So, in fact, we have so many servers that a couple of them restarting at any given time is not a problem for us. And um, the previous graph was just misleading us into, uh, into thinking there was one. So, so because the previous one was not pinned at zero and therefore did not give us a good, a good idea of the, of the amount of change that we were seeing. Um, similarly, error ratios. Um, a graph of error ratio like this tells you exactly nothing until you look at the, at the axis. In this case, the axis is in like um, tenth, tenth of percent. So even if we're looking at a highly available four, five, nines um, availability system, this type of error ratio, error rate is not a problem for us. Error ratio is not a problem for us. Um, this one is particular, particularly funny. Um, and we're, we're also going to get back to this problem a little bit later on. Every dashboarding system pretty much always has more data that it can display to you because there's just not enough pixels on a screen to display all the data. So there is some implicit downsampling going on all the time. Now, different types of hardware have different amounts of pixels. If you have a MacBook like this, it has a high-resolution retina screen with, I don't know, 250 or something DPI. 
Um, if you look on, if you have a different laptop, it will have a lower resolution screen. And your monitoring system might render graphs differently based on the res resolution of the screen. This is GNU plot. Um, GNU plot will actually render graphs differently de depending on the resolution. So if you're looking at this graph on a low le resolution screen, it looks like this. If you look at the same graph on a Retina MacBook, it looks like this. Now, if you're in a habit of eyeballing min and max um, request rates, for example, from these types of graphs, depending on what hardware you're, looking to, you're using to look at the graph, you're going to get different numbers. So not only do the graphs lie to you based on how you set axes and stuff, the hardware also lies to you, depending on what resolution it has. Next one, lying through selection. This goes back to the point of there's always more data than we can actually display. Um, let's say you want to look at, say, error rates of a, of a system, and you want to pick just the ones that have the highest error rate. So you're telling your monitoring system, well, t show me just the graph for the service that have the highest error rate. And you're getting a graph like this. Now, the problem is, if you're instructing the system to show you just the graphs with the highest error rate, it will always look like this. Because you will notice in the legend that we are only looking at about five of a thousand or more tasks. There's always going to be, through fluctuation, some that have a higher error rate than the others. And the monitoring system is always going to pick those. And it will hide the, um, it would, it will hide the shape of, the, of, of everything else. Oh, and this is, this is one of my favorite ones. Um, there is actually a parallel panel going on um, at the same time, which is statistics for engineers, I think. And if I had a choice, I would actually send all of you over there. I would not have you in this talk. I would send you to Statistics for Engineers. Because I'm a computer scientist, and looking at fellow computer scientists, I think I can say, on average, computer scientists do not know statistics. So, we like simple solutions. We like looking at simple things that we can understand. So very often, we're going to do things like, oh, we're going to look at, at average request latencies, even though inside that server, we're handling different types of requests that have wildly different, um, wildly different latency characteristics. You're mixing together high latency requests with low latency requests in the same server. You're taking the average, it's not going to tell you anything. Now, you might be thinking, well, if averages are bad, then I'm going to be smarter than that. And I'm going to use percentiles. Because percentiles like tell you something about latency distributions, so that must be better. So let's look at percentiles. If you want to calculate percentiles, well, you're going to look at a, um, at a latency distribution. Um, let's take an idealized uh, service here with an average latency of 100 milliseconds, standard deviation of, I think, 20 milliseconds in that graph, and you're getting a cumulative distribution out of that. You're taking the 95th percentile, and the 95th percentile of that is about 130 milliseconds. What happens when you want to implement this in a monitoring system. Now, first of all, you can't get latency profiles out of monitoring systems, at least not the continuous um, profiles like this. You're going to have to bucket things. So you're going to split your latency range up into different buckets from zero to, to one milliseconds, one to two, two to three, and so on. And you're going to count how many requests you have falling into the different buckets. Um, and then you're going to build a cumulative distribution from that. You're going to use linear interpolation between the different buckets, and um, you're going to get a cumulative distribution. Very often, if you're doing this type of bucketing, you're going to use exponentially growing bucket sizes. The reason for this is the following. 
if you actually want to sum up those histograms between different servers, they all have to be the same size. The buckets all have to be the same size. Otherwise, you cannot sum them up. So this also means that if you want to get useful data out of this, you have to choose your bucketing scheme in advance. Now, your bucketing scheme is going to depend on the structure of your data. And it's really hard to find a bucketing scheme that will work for every kind of data. But people usually, um, people usually reason that, well, if we're building this kind of scheme, we're probably going to want high resolution in like low quantities. We're going to be able to get away with a um, little bigger resolution in higher quantities. So we're going to use these, uh, these exponentially growing bucket sizes. Now, this is a, a, a bucketed histogram with a growth factor between the buckets of um, 1.2. And if we interpolate that, we're going to get a 95th percentile of 130 milliseconds. Now, these buckets are expensive because each of those buckets generates monitoring data in your monitoring system. So you want to be kind of conservative about how many of these buckets you use. And you might be thinking that, well, maybe I can get away with a little bit coarser resolution. And we're going to look at what happens when we do that. Now, this was a growth factor of 1.2. If we go to a growth factor of 1.4, um, it looks like this. We get a 95th percentile of 150 milliseconds. 130 milliseconds to 150 milliseconds, ah, still pretty OK. Let's go higher. Growth factor of 2. 95th percentile, 180 milliseconds. Growth factor of 4. 95th percentile, 250 milliseconds. So we went from 130 milliseconds, 95th percentile, in the actual data to our monitoring system reporting 250 milliseconds. Um, this is not a hypothetical example. There is a monitoring system out there that uses a growth factor of four as the default when it does bucketed histograms. Um, and that can grossly overestimate uh, the percentiles that you're looking at. And I believe this brings me to the end of my talk. So to summarize, we've seen a number of examples, a number of categories of ways that your monitoring system can mislead you and can lie to you. Um, rather than concentrating too much on the concrete examples that I've, I've talked about, what I would like you to take away from this talk is, as I mentioned, healthy distrust for what your dashboards show you. If your dashboards show you something strange, go to the underlying data. Understand where that data is coming from, what perspective it's getting uh, collected from, and also what processing you're doing on the data. Um, before I go to Q&A, this talk would not have been possible without the help of some of my coworkers that um, helped me understand these, these issues better, contributed their own examples and their own categories. And um, with that, I'm at the end of my talk. Are there questions? We have time for questions, right? Yes. Uh, there is a mic in the middle, if anybody. I know I can always count on my co-workers. So I've, I've been bitten by the bucketed histogram one before. Um, uh, why do they need to be exponentially growing? Why can't we get like great resolution at the one end and decent resolution where we think the 99th percentile or 95th percentile is going to go? Because you don't know in advance what the range of the data is going to be like. And you have to, you have to choose the bucketing scheme before you have seen the first data point. Mm -hmm. Because you can't re-bucket at runtime. Right. So if you, if you want to have a scheme that works both for, say, uh, quantities collected in nanoseconds and milliseconds, you, you have to cover a ginormous range, and you have to choose something that hopefully, maybe, is going to work for even the extreme cases. I, I, okay, so the, the reason I was wondering was, uh, I, I've also been running systems where, yeah, our SLA was 300 milliseconds and 95th percentile, 
and then we made improvements and the 95th percentile we suddenly could reach 70 milliseconds and our monitoring was kind of crappy and we ended up just throwing it all out um, and redoing. So does the, the exponential buckets also probably give you a better idea at if you, your service suddenly improves or, or disimproves, you can cope with it to an extent without throwing out the old time series. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Hello. Just to add uh, a little bit, uh, because I was also working with exponential histograms, the idea there is that <coughs> what exponential uh, histograms guarantee is uh, the maximum error of the answer that you get. Like with exponential factor 1.2, you get a maximum 20% error. Mm -hmm. Like it, if you pick this factor, it says, okay, you are getting something that is uh, uh, at most 20% inaccurate compared to the real, uh, uh, to the, to the real answer. Yeah. And if you get a, a exponential factor of 4, this means something uh, like uh, 400% inaccurate. Yes, that, that, is, that is one of the, um, one of the biggest uh, lie with statistics that nobody shows you error bars. Yeah, yeah. So, so nobody <laughs> shows you how much error the system so, is actually uh, allowing But for you. I don't think it is uh, it's, uh, a lot expensive. Like if, you, if we pick something like uh, uh, a 10% error and you go over the integer range, you, you get something like uh, 500 buckets, so it's not you, you, you could probably you could so for, for a lot of these um, examples that I've shown you um, a lot of them are solvable um, And that is specifically what I didn't want to concentrate on in this talk Because a lot of them are solvable, but in order to solve them you have to know about them first and if you've never seen this then you Maybe you're not even going to think about how to solve it. Yes. Um, like from your talk, um, does it even make sense to have dashboards uh, at all in the future? Because, um, yeah, I mean, come on, you for example, the graphs, if you pin it at zero or not, so you barely know what you're looking for, and that's how you create your dashboard. Mm -hmm. So you will only find the errors you already know could happen, so you barely look in the interesting parts, and this is put on the dashboard. So, um, in the end, you will not, never find the errors you don't know. Uh, this is a philosophical discussion that is probably better suited for the refreshments break. <laughs> um, but yes, I try to cultivate, a, 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 as I said, a distrust in the, in the dashboards. They are, if you know what they're showing, they can give you indicators. They can, they can be the basis for hypothesis of what might be happening but you have to verify those hypotheses outside of the dashboarding system. So. so just from your personal experience, do you rather have a dashboard whatever with a percentile number to, or like um, very colorful graphs and a lot of information which might lead to like wrong uh, assumptions? Or how do you tackle this? Um, I, would, I would not tackle this by one or the other. Um, I would tackle this by training. Okay, always the right answer, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I think we're out of time, so thank you very much.